You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. As well, you can hear these podcasts at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. There are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 155 by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Christ and the Human Soul. It's in uh, four parts, and it's translated, these ten lectures, by Agnes Schneeberg de Stur. And uh, this is the fourth part, the last part, just one lecture, a public lecture, entitled Anthroposophy and Christianity. And it's uh, lecture number ten, given in Nürköping on July 13, 1914. Before anything else, I would like to ask your forgiveness for being unable to speak to you tonight in your native language. But the friends who have been attending my lectures in these last few days, lectures to members of the Anthroposophical Society, have assured me that it would be all right to speak to you in German in this public lecture on a spiritual scientific topic. The local members have also suggested the theme for this evening's lecture. I am to speak about the relationship of spiritual science, or anthroposophy, as it may also be called, about the relationship of anthroposophy to Christianity. However, in order to do so, I must first say something about the nature and significance of what is meant by spiritual science, about the point of view from which I shall be speaking tonight. Spiritual science, as it is meant here, does not seek to found a new religion, or a new religious sect of any kind. It aspires to provide and carry out what, in a spiritual sense, is required of our contemporary culture. If we are to make progress today in a realm that is in need of progress, the realm of humanity's cultural development, in the same way as three, four, five hundred years ago, progress was made when modern natural science entered into human cultural life, then we must say the following. What natural science has become for the lives of human beings through the knowledge of outer nature, through the knowledge of the external laws of physics? This is what spiritual science aspires to become in the present time and in the near future, through knowledge of the laws of our soul spiritual life. And by applying these laws in the ethical, social, and all other fields of cultural life, And as much as this spiritual science is still misunderstood and misjudged, and understandably so, it can nonetheless have confidence in its trueness and its effectiveness for human cultural life when it considers how the natural sciences developed at the beginning of the modern age. Natural scientists, too, had to confront existing prejudices hundreds and even thousands of years old. But truth contains powers which, in a manner suitable to human life, always help it prevail against any opposing forces. Now that we have spoken briefly about the spiritual scientist's confidence in the trueness and effectiveness of his work, let us turn to the essential nature of the research that forms the basis of spiritual science as it is meant here. The way in which thoughts and mental images are formed in spiritual science is very much in keeping with the methods used in the natural sciences. However, since spiritual science covers a field that is very different from the field covered by natural science, that is to say the field of the spirit, not the sense-perceptible field of external nature, It should be obvious that researching the spiritual realm requires a fundamental modification of the natural scientific approach. And even though the research methods of spiritual science are in keeping with those of natural science, in the sense that any unprejudiced person trained in natural science can accept the premises of spiritual science, it must nevertheless be said that as long as the natural scientific method is conceived one-sidedly, as all too often happens today. Prejudice will be heaped upon prejudice when it comes to applying the natural, scientific way of thinking to spiritual life. 
for it is indeed the case that natural scientific thinking and logic must be applied to what most concerns human beings. But what is at the same time most difficult to investigate, namely, to the essential nature of the human being? And it is indeed the case that in spiritual science we must examine our own essential human nature, and that we have to make use of the only tool that we have at our disposal, namely ourselves. The premise of spiritual science is that inasmuch as we ourselves become the instrument of investigation into the spiritual world, we have to undergo a transformation and have to undertake something with respect to ourselves that makes it possible for us to look into the spiritual world, which we cannot do in ordinary life. Allow me to begin with a comparison taken from natural science, not to prove anything, but merely to illustrate how the spiritual scientific way of forming concepts rests entirely on the premises of the natural scientific way of thinking. Let us take water as an example drawn from nature. If we look at water, as we encounter it all around us, then it reveals certain qualities. But when the chemists apply their methods in order to analyze the water, they break it down into hydrogen and oxygen. Very well, but what are they actually doing to the water? As you all know, water doesn't burn, but the chemist isolates hydrogen from the water, and hydrogen is a gas that burns. No person just looking at water can tell that it contains hydrogen and oxygen, which each have properties that are totally different from water. It is equally impossible, as spiritual science points out, to see the true inner being of another person just by looking at that person. And just as the chemist, the natural scientist, splits water into hydrogen and oxygen, so does the spiritual scientist differentiate what presents itself in outer life, albeit by means of an inner process that must be prepared in the soul's very depths. The spiritual scientist can differentiate through spiritual scientific research methods, what is external physical and what is soul spiritual in human beings, because the first thing he is interested in investigating from the viewpoint of spiritual science is the soul spiritual aspect as something distinct from the bodily nature. It is not possible to discern the true reality of the soul spiritual aspect by studying the external bodily nature any more than it is possible to discern the nature of hydrogen without first extracting it from water. Nowadays it often happens that as soon as one begins to say something like the above, people will argue that this violates the precepts of monism, which, quote, ought to be adhered to at all costs, close quote. It is, however, a fact that monism also cannot keep chemists from splitting water into two parts, in point of fact, monism is not contested when something that can actually happen does happen. For instance, when the soul spiritual is recognized as distinct from the bodily nature through the methods of spiritual research. These methods, admittedly, are not of the type that can be applied in laboratory settings or in hospitals. They are processes that have to take place in the soul itself. However, they are not soul processes that represent something miraculous. Rather, they are an enhancement of what we can observe in ordinary life. They are not miraculous traits, but rather the kind of faculties we already possess to a certain degree in daily life. It is only that they need to be raised to a much higher level if one is to become a spiritual researcher. And since I do not want to just speak in generalities, I will now go straight into a consideration of the subject itself. We are all familiar with the soul capacity known as memory, and we all know how much ultimately depends on it. Imagine waking up some morning with no idea of where we have been or who we are. We would lose everything that makes us human. Our memory, which has had its own inner coherence ever since early childhood, necessarily belongs to our life as human beings. The study of memory unquestionably leaves contemporary philosophers perplexed. 
There are even some among them who go so far as to deviate from the monistic, materialistic view, precisely when it comes to studying memory, inasmuch as they find through exacting research that although sensory perception, to the degree that one can even speak of a soul activity in this way, is bound to the physical body, it will never be possible to say that memory is bound to the body. I would just like to call your attention to this. For even a man who certainly shows no inclination to enter deeply into anthroposophy, namely the French philosopher Bergson, has pointed to this spiritual nature of memory. How do we actually experience memory and the power of recall? Long, bygone events enter our soul as images, and although the events themselves may lie far in the past, the soul is dealing with something that involves itself. The soul is actively involved in conjuring up these past events out of the depths of its inner life. And what emerges from these depths can be compared with the original experience, although in contrast to the images presented by our sensory perceptions, Memories are pale, but they are closely connected with the integrity of the life of the soul. Without memory, we would not be able to find our way in the world. But memory is based upon the power of recall, and the soul can retrieve what is hidden in its memories through this power of recall. This is precisely where spiritual science comes in. It is not memory as such. Please note how I am saying this, but rather the power needed for the retrieval of the spiritual content from the soul's depths that can be strengthened, infinitely strengthened, so that this power can then be used not only for retrieving past experiences from the soul, but also for quite other purposes. Methods of spiritual research are not based upon any external procedures such as those pursued in laboratories, or upon anything perceptible to external senses, but rather upon intensive soul processes which anyone can undergo. The value of these soul processes lies in the limitless intensification of mindfulness, attentiveness, in German Aufmerksamkeit, or it can also be called the concentration of our life of thoughts, What is this concentration of our life of thoughts? Since there is limited time this evening, I can only touch on the principles of the topic under discussion. You can find the details in my book's title, Knowledge of the Higher Worlds and Its Attainment, title, An Outline of Esoteric Science, Chapter 5, and title, The Threshold of the Spiritual World. In reference to these principles, I will outline the basic soul efforts that constitute a limitless enhancement of something that is necessary for human life, an enhancement of attentiveness. Attentiveness, mindfulness, must be strengthened to an unlimited extent so that spiritual research becomes possible. What activity do we usually engage in when we confront our surroundings? We perceive things, we process them through our intellect, which is bound to our brain, and then we form mental images about these perceptions. And as a rule, we are content to hold these external mental images in our soul. But it is precisely at the point where our everyday mental life leaves off that the methods of spiritual science begin. That is the point where concentration of thinking, as we have called it, begins. Anyone wanting to become a spiritual researcher must pick up the thread of his or her soul life at the very point where ordinary life abandons it. We bring certain mental images into the scope of our consciousness, images that we build up for ourselves and oversee ourselves. These should preferably be symbolic images that do not need to correspond to anything in the external world. We can either choose them ourselves, take them from the practical experience of spiritual science, or they can be suggested to us by the spiritual researcher. We place these images at the center of our whole consciousness, 
so that for a certain length of time we turn our soul's attentiveness away from everything else, concentrating only on this one single image. Whereas normally we do not keep our attention just on one mental image, in this case we draw together all our soul forces, concentrate them on one chosen image, and devote ourselves inwardly to this image. When we observe someone who is doing this, that person appears to be engaged in something resembling sleep, although it is in fact radically different. For if such concentration is to be fruitful, then the person in question must indeed become like someone who is sleeping. As we are falling asleep, we initially feel how the will forces in our limbs quiet down, how a kind of twilight settles around us, how the senses' activity ebbs away. Then we lose consciousness. In practicing concentration, everything external must become as it is in sleep, our senses must be wholly freed from all impressions of the outer world. The eye, E-Y-E, should see as little as in sleep. The ear should hear as little as in sleep, and so on. Then the whole soul life is drawn together and concentrated on a single mental image. This is what makes concentration radically different from sleep. One could refer to this state as conscious sleeping fully conscious sleeping. Whereas in sleep the darkness of unconsciousness expands in the soul, the aspiring spiritual researcher lives in a heightened state of soul activity. He or she musters all the forces of the soul and turns them toward one mental image. The important thing here is not that we observe this image, rather that it gives us the opportunity to pull our soul forces together and condense them. This pulling together of the soul forces is what matters, because in this way we gradually get to the point of separating the soul spiritual, which is like the hydrogen in water, from the bodily nature, of freeing it from this physical bodily nature. And again I refer you to my books for the details. What I have just described cannot be achieved in one big surge, so to speak. Most people have to work for years on concentration exercises of this sort. Daily life is not affected by doing concentration exercises such as these because they can only be carried out for a few minutes at a time or for a fraction of an hour at most. But they must be repeated again and again until we really succeed in strengthening the forces that would otherwise only slumber in our essential being. These are forces that are present in daily life too, but slumber, so that they become effective in our soul and free the soul spiritual from our physical bodily nature. Since, as mentioned, I do not want to speak in an abstract way, but rather present you with facts, let me say forthwith that if, as spiritual researcher, one succeeds in achieving fruitful results, through energy and perseverance, through devotion toward the exercises. Then one comes to a special experience, an experience of what can be called a purely inner consciousness. From a certain point onward, one can then begin to make sense of a statement that previously meant nothing. Quote, I know that I am outside my body. In the process of grasping and experiencing my inner being, I am outside my body. Close quote. I will describe this experience to you in detail. The first thing one notices is that the power of thinking, which normally is activated only during everyday life, frees itself from the body. To begin with, this experience is faint, but it occurs in such a way that we are able to recognize it for what it is once we have had it. Only when we return to our body, I would like to characterize this first, and are immersed again in the brain's functioning, do we realize what resistance the brain presents because of its physical substance. We know that for our normal everyday thinking the brain is the instrument, but we are aware that we have been outside it. We gradually learn to make sense of the statement, quote, you are experiencing yourself in the world of soul and spirit, close quote. 
we experience how our head is surrounded, wrapped, as it were, with its thoughts. We know what it means to feel the soul spiritual separated from the physical bodily nature. First we learn to know the resistance presented by life in a physical body. Then we learn to recognize life independent of the body. It truly is just as if hydrogen were to become capable of perceiving itself outside of the water. That is how it is for a person who does exercises of this kind. And if that person continues to practice them faithfully, a great and significant moment arrives which constitutes the beginning of actual spiritual research. It is a profoundly shattering moment which affects one's whole life in a most significant way. This moment can occur in the most diverse ways, in thousands of different ways, but I will describe it as it most typically comes about. If we have practiced these exercises for a certain period of time, if we have, out of the natural scientific method of thinking, worked upon our souls like this, then the moment arrives, either during waking life or even in the middle of sleep, in such a way that we awaken and realize that we are not dreaming, but rather are experiencing a new reality. This experience can, for example, be such that we say to ourselves, quote, What is it that is around me? It is as though I were in surroundings that are receding from me, as though the elements were hitting me like lightning strikes, and as though my body were being destroyed by the elements, and I nevertheless maintained myself, unlike this body of mine. Close quote. We come to know what all spiritual researchers throughout the ages have referred to, using a pictorial expression as, quote, coming to the gates of death. Close quote. For what we experience through this image, in other words, not through reality, which we get to know only in death, is that we become aware of what we really are as soul spiritual beings when we no longer perceive ourselves and the world through the instrument of our body, but instead are living purely in the world of soul and spirit. This is to begin with a shattering experience because one recognizes, quote, you have released yourself from your body through the power of your thinking. Close quote. And other forces can be similarly released from the body so that the human being becomes ever richer, ever more inward as regards the life of the soul. But this one exercise, which I have characterized as concentration or quote, the limitless enhancement of attentiveness, close quote, is not enough. Through this exercise we achieve the following result. When we have come to the point where the soul experiences itself, images rise up, which can be called real imaginations. Images arise, but these images are vastly different from those of our ordinary memory. Whereas ordinary memory holds only images of what has been experienced externally, the images now arising from the gray depths of the soul have nothing in common with anything that can be experienced in the outer world of the senses. And any objections raised, that it would be easy to deceive oneself, that what thus arises from these gray soul depths may be nothing more than recollections produced by memory, are irrelevant. For the spiritual researcher learns to distinguish precisely between those things that memory can call up and those things that are radically different from what is contained in memory. Admittedly, there is something that must be taken into consideration when speaking about this moment of entering the spiritual world, namely, that people who suffer from visions, hallucinations, or other abnormal conditions are not well suited to spiritual research. The less one has a tendency toward such things, which are merely echoes of everyday experiences, the more securely one advances in the field of spiritual research. A large part of the preparation for spiritual research consists in learning to distinguish exactly between all those things that somehow rise up unconsciously from the soul in an unhealthy manner and that which can appear as a new element, as a spiritual reality, through the spiritual scientific schooling of the soul. I would like to point out a radical difference between what is visionary 
or hallucinatory, and what the spiritual researcher perceives. Why is it that so many people believe themselves to be already in the spiritual world when they are only having hallucinations and visions? Generally, people are so very reluctant to learn something really new. They prefer to cling to the old and familiar. The unhealthy soul conditions manifested in hallucinations and visions essentially present themselves in the same way as external sensory reality presents itself to us. They are simply there, appearing to us. One could say that we do nothing to make them appear. This is not the situation of the spiritual researcher as regards this new spiritual element. I have mentioned that the spiritual researcher has to concentrate, refine, and strengthen all the forces of his soul, forces that are, typically, slumbering. This, however, requires him to exert a strength of soul, an energy of soul, not present in external life. He must constantly hold on to this strength when he enters the spiritual world. It is characteristic of hallucinations and visions that the person in question remains passive, does not need to exert him or herself. But as soon as one becomes passive toward the spiritual world, for even a moment, everything disappears. One must stay with it incessantly and be continuously active. That is also the reason why we cannot be mistaken in this regard, since nothing from the spiritual world can present itself to us in the way a vision or hallucination does. We must be fully and actively present in confronting every least detail of what appears to us from the spiritual world. We must know what we are facing. This action, this continual activity, is essential for true spiritual research. When that is present, we enter a world radically different from the physical world of the senses. We enter a world where spiritual realities and spiritual beings are all around us. But something else is needed as well. The process of resting the soul away from the body occurs in the way described above. But the next thing can again best be explained through a comparison from natural science. When we extract hydrogen, it initially exists in isolation, but then it combines with other substances and becomes something quite different. The same thing must take place with respect to our soul spiritual being after its separation from the body. The soul spiritual must conjoin with beings not of the sensory world. It must unite and become one with these beings. Then it can perceive them. The first stage of spiritual research is this separation of the soul spiritual from the physical bodily nature. The second stage involves entering into relationships with beings that are present behind the visible world of the senses. Speaking of such beings is not really acceptable nowadays. Talking about, in quotes, spirit in general, is far less objectionable. Many people today feel the urge to acknowledge the existence of something spiritual. They speak of a spirit behind the worldly realm and are quite satisfied to be pantheists, in quotes. But to the spiritual researcher, pantheism is just like taking someone out into nature and remarking, quote, look, all this around you is nature, close quote, instead of saying, quote, those are trees, those are clouds, that is a lily, and that is a rose, close quote. If we lead someone from one scene to another, from one phenomenon to another, and say, quote, all this is nature, close quote, then nothing has actually been conveyed to that person. The facts must be approached concretely and in detail. It is quite acceptable today to speak of a spirit, a spirit in everything. But the spiritual researcher cannot be satisfied with that. After all, he is entering a world that consists of spirit beings and spiritual realities, a world as differentiated as the external world is concretely differentiated, inasmuch as it consists of clouds, mountains, valleys, trees, flowers, and so on. But although it is perfectly acceptable to speak of differentiating the natural phenomena that occur in the plant, animal, and human kingdoms, it is not acceptable today 
to speak of the concrete details and facts of a spiritual world that appear to a human being entering into that world. However, the spiritual researcher cannot do otherwise than point out that entering the spiritual world means entering a world of real, concrete spiritual beings and spiritual processes. The second thing that then becomes necessary is that we enhance our sense of devotion, the kind of devotion felt in everyday life or the religious piety experienced in a more intensified form of everyday life. And again, this must be infinitely strengthened so that we can actually come to the stage of giving ourselves up to resting in the stream of cosmic events as we rest in sleep. In contemplation or meditation, we must become oblivious to any stirrings of our own body, again as we do in sleep. This is the second exercise, and it must alternate with the first. As we are doing the exercise, we forget our body completely, not only in the sense of no longer thinking about it, but in such a way that we can even shut out all the stirrings of feeling and will, just as in sleep we shut out all awareness of bodily stirrings. But this condition must be brought about consciously. By adding this devotion exercise to the first one, we reach the stage of actually placing ourselves in a spiritual world with the help of our awakening spiritual senses, just as we find our way into the physical sensory world all around us with the help of our external senses. A new world now dawns before us. It is the world in which we human beings always are with our soul spiritual being. And then a certain fact becomes a reality. What becomes real for our inner observation is something that is still rejected by current prejudices although it is just as much the result of strictly scientific research as is our modern evolutionary theory. The reality referred to here is that we come to know the sole spiritual core of our being in such a way that we realize, quote, before I was conceived and born into this life which clothed me in a body, I existed as a soul spiritual being in a spiritual realm. When I pass through the gates of death, my body will fall away. But what I have now come to know as the sole spiritual core of my being, which can live outside my body, will pass through the gates of death. Once it has passed through these gates, it belongs to a spiritual world and enters into a spiritual world. Close quote. In other words, we learn to recognize already in this life between birth and death, the immortality of the soul. We learn to recognize that which we know to be independent of the body. We come to know the world which the human soul enters after death. But we come to know this soul-spiritual essence of the human being in a way that can be described with scientific clarity. When we observe a plant, how the seed germinates, how leaves and blossoms develop, how the fruit forms and then again produces new seed, we recognize that the life of the plant culminates in the seed. We see how the leaves and blossoms drop off, but also that the seed remains, bearing within it a new plant. In this way we become aware that the seed, the germ of a new plant, is already living in the plant we are observing. And similarly, we learn to recognize by observing human life between birth and death, that what is developing in the soul-spiritual element and then passes through the gates of death is actually the germ, the seed, of a new life. And just as a plant seed has the inherent potential to become a new plant, so does what is hidden in the everyday life of our soul-spiritual being but shows itself to spiritual science carry the inherent potential for a new human life. Looking at things in this way, we come to acknowledge the reality of repeated earth lives in a manner fully consistent with the natural scientific way of thinking. We know that the sum total of a human being's life consists both of the life between birth and death and of the life occurring between death and rebirth, from which the human being then enters into a new incarnation. The only possible objection to what I have just said is that the germinating seed could perish 
if conditions were such that a new plant could not develop from the seed. Spiritual science meets this objection by pointing out that while it is true that the plant seed, in its dependence on outer conditions, may perish, there is nothing in the spiritual world where the human soul core being ripens in preparation for a new life on earth to hinder the soul being that has evolved in one earth life from appearing again in a subsequent earth life. I can only indicate briefly how the spiritual researcher adhering to natural scientific methods of investigation comes to this view of repeated earth lives. People have accused spiritual science of being Buddhistic because it speaks of repeated earth lives, of reincarnation. In point of fact, spiritual science does not derive what it has to say from Buddhism. It is firmly founded on the principles of modern natural science. But it expands this modern natural science to cover the life of the spirit. Spiritual science has no choice but to acknowledge without taking Buddhism into account at all, the reality of reincarnation. It can only acknowledge that in earlier times, Buddhism spoke out of ancient traditions about repeated earth lives. I would like to mention in this connection that the German writer Lessing, having acquired a mature, experience-rich capacity of thinking, came to speak of reincarnation. At the end of a long, work-filled life, Lessing wrote his treatise on the education of the human race in which he proposed the idea of repeated earth lives. He said somewhat as follows, quote, Is this teaching to be rejected simply because it appeared at the dawn of humanity before any academic prejudices could cloud it? Close quote. And just as Lessing refused to be swayed by the fact that this teaching of reincarnation emerged at the dawn of humanity, and was later pushed into the background by scholarly prejudice, so also does spiritual science need not shy away from this teaching simply because it also appears in Buddhism. There is no reason then to accuse spiritual science of Buddhistic leanings. Spiritual science acknowledges the truth of repeated earth lives out of its own sources. It points out that human beings are connected with the totality of humanity's development on the earth because the souls living in us have been here many times before and will return again and again. If we look back to earlier cultural epochs, for instance, to the time when people lifted up their eyes to the pyramids, then we know that our souls were already living at that time, that they will appear again in the future and that they take part in all the developmental stages of humanity. It is still perfectly understandable today that people have a bias against such teachings. There are also people who interpret everything according to how they would like it to be. That Lessing was a great man is a known fact, but that he acknowledged the truth of reincarnation at the apex of his life is something that makes many people uncomfortable. So they will say, quote, Oh, well, Lessing had turned feeble in his old age, close quote. That makes people more comfortable than to think that human beings are closely bound up with all of earthly civilization. Now, how does spiritual science want to present the things I have just explained to contemporary culture? In exactly the same way as natural science presents its findings. But inasmuch as spiritual science steps out into contemporary culture, it is subject to the same prejudices as natural science was a few centuries ago with regard to its new discoveries. Just think of Copernicus, Galileo, or Giordano Bruno. How was it back then, when Copernicus claimed that the earth did not stand still but revolved around the sun, and that it was actually the sun that stood still in relation to the earth? How did people react? They thought that religion was at stake, that people's religious piety was jeopardized by this advance in knowledge. It took certain religious denominations until the 19th century to remove the teachings of Copernicus from the index and to integrate them into their church doctrines. In every age, progress of the human spirit has had to fight against old prejudices, 
This new spiritual knowledge wants to enter human culture today in the same way as contemporary natural scientific knowledge did in its day. Spiritual science wants to point out that human beings have the ability to know something about the spiritual and that humanity is ready to acquire this knowledge, just as Copernicus, Galileo and Giordano Bruno pointed to the need for a new knowledge, a new science of nature, at a time when humanity was ready for it. And just as back in his time even Nicholas Copernicus, a canon of the Church, was accused of not being a Christian, so it is easy again today to accuse modern spiritual science of being unchristian with respect to certain points of view. Whenever this happens, I am always reminded of a certain priest who, on becoming rector of his university, delivered a lecture about Galileo. On that occasion he spoke somewhat as follows, quote, It is simply a fact that in those days people had religious prejudices when they confronted Copernicus. Those, however, who are truly religious know that God's glory and light are not dimmed when we penetrate the secrets of the universe through knowledge. They know that the grandeur of our view of God has only increased as a result of expanding our knowledge beyond the realm of the senses to calculating the course of the stars and determining the particular characteristics of the heavenly bodies. Close quote. That religion is only enriched when it deepens its scientific knowledge, this is something that can be seen by anyone with a truly religious disposition. Spiritual science does not aspire to found a new religion. It does not want to start a new sect. It does not want to bring forth prophets or founders of religions. The time for founding religions, the time for prophets, has passed. Humanity has matured. And those people who, in times to come, feel the need to appear to humanity as prophets will suffer a different fate from the prophets of old, who, in keeping with the characteristics of their times, were rightly revered as outstanding individuals. Today's, in quotes, prophets, who aspire to be prophets in the old sense, will simply be laughed at. Spiritual science has no need for any prophets, because by its very nature it builds on the fact that what it has to say is already present in the depths of the human soul. These are depths, however, that cannot always be illumined by the light of the human soul. And whatever the spiritual investigator has to say, he wants to investigate as an unassuming researcher. He wants to draw attention to things of vital importance and says, quote, I have discovered them. You, too, can discover these things for yourself if you want to. The time is approaching when the spiritual investigator will be recognized simply as a researcher, just as chemists or biologists are recognized in their respective fields. The only difference is that the spiritual researcher investigates a field that concerns every human soul. In this lecture, I could only sketch some of the things that can be found when research is done in this field. But if you study the matter in more detail, you will find that this research addresses the most vital questions for the human soul, questions concerning humanity and questions concerning its destiny. Both are questions that can move us profoundly every hour of every day, questions that strengthen the human soul for its tasks. And because the field of this spiritual research concerns the depths of the human soul, it is only natural that it takes hold of us, that it unites with our deepest inner self, and that as a result we develop a deeper sensitivity in our religious feelings, becoming more religious in the way we perceive things, more so than we would otherwise have done. Spiritual science does not want to replace Christianity. Rather, it aims to be the instrument through which the meaning of Christianity can be grasped. And one thing that will become particularly clear through spiritual science is that the being whom we call Christ must be recognized as the center of life on earth, and that what we call the Christian faith is the ultimate religion, the eternal religion for the future of the earth. Spiritual science shows us in particular that the pre-Christian religions outgrow their one-sidedness and come together in the Christian religion. 
spiritual science does not want to replace Christianity with something else. Rather, it wants to contribute to a deeper, more inwardly felt understanding of Christianity. Would it be correct to say that Copernicus, when he was working in quiet isolation and came to his conception of the solar system, wanted to reshape the order of nature? It would be madness to say anything of the sort. Nature stayed as it was, but people learned to think about nature in a way that concurred with the new view of the world. I took the liberty of calling a book on Christianity that I wrote many years ago titled Christianity as Mystical Fact. Someone in the habit of giving careful thought to what he presents to the world would not choose such a title lightly. Why then did I choose this title? Only in order to show that Christianity is not a mere doctrine that can be interpreted in one way or another, that it rather has entered the world as a fact, as a reality that can only be comprehended from its spiritual aspect. And just as nature has not changed because of Copernicus, so does the reality of Christianity not change when spiritual science is used as a tool for understanding it better and in a more complete sense than was possible in times gone by. Even though I have already taken more time than was intended, you will perhaps permit me to draw your attention to one concrete aspect of Christian spiritual research. If we trace the ancient pre-Christian cultures as seen by the spiritual researcher, we find that all these cultures had what can be called mystery centers, places that were simultaneously centers of religion, art, and science. Although the external culture of earlier civilizations was such that people would not have been able nor permitted to penetrate into the spiritual world by means of the spiritual scientific methods I have described, it was possible for certain individuals to be admitted into the mysteries. They were the pupils, or as they can also be called, the candidates for initiation. Their mystery schooling brought them to the stage of achieving what was described earlier, namely withdrawing from the physical body. Through the artful methods applied in the mysteries, they were brought to the stage of developing a body-free soul existence. And what did they gain through this body-free life of the soul? It became possible for them to experience the spiritual world and the central event in the history of humanity on earth, the Christ event. Traditional scholarship pays far too little attention to the role played by these pupils of the mysteries, although much could be presented to show that this is the case. Let me mention one instance a statement made by a church father that gives an indication of this. St. Augustine said that there have been Christians not only since Christ's appearance on earth, but already prior to that time. Anyone saying this today would be accused of heresy. But a church father was allowed to say that there were Christians before Christ's appearance on earth, and this was indeed St. Augustine's view. Why did this Christian teacher state such a thing? We can get some insight into why he said this when we turn to Plato, for instance, and read how he valued the mysteries and how he speaks of their significance for the whole existence and life of humanity. A particular saying of Plato, which may well seem harsh to us, has been handed down to us. He said that human souls live in muddy swamps as long as they have not been initiated into the holy mysteries. Plato said this because he was convinced that the human soul is essentially of a soul-spiritual nature, and that only those who withdraw their soul from the physical body through a mystery initiation can behold the spiritual world. To Plato, a person who has not entered into the mysteries, is like someone cut off from his true being. The crucial point is that in ancient times, the path through the mysteries was the only way to leave the physical world of the senses and gain entry into the world of the spirit. That, however, is no longer the case. The relationship of the human soul to the spiritual world is completely different today from the way it was in pre-Christian times. <clears throat> 
what I have described here today and what each soul can undertake for itself with respect to gaining access to the spiritual world, this has been possible only since the founding of Christianity. Since then, every soul who applies the methods set forth in this lecture and in the books mentioned above can ascend into the spiritual world through a process of self-education. In pre-Christian times, people needed the mysteries and the authoritative guidance of teachers. There was no such thing as self-initiation in those times. And if spiritual sciences asked how this change came about, then it must reply, based on its research, that this was made possible through the mystery of Golgotha. Through the founding of Christianity, a new fact, a fact, that can only be researched spiritually has come to pass for humanity. Something that previously could only be found in the realm of the spirit when human beings withdrew from their bodies through mystery initiations, that is, the Christ himself, can since the founding of Christianity be found by every human soul through its own efforts. What the mysteries once introduced into human souls is now, since the mystery of Golgotha, embedded within every human soul. It has been bestowed on all human souls alike. How did this come about? Spiritual science reveals that as Jesus was living in the way you can find described in the Gospels, there came a moment in his life at the baptism in the Jordan when he was transformed, when something that had not been there before entered into him and then lived within him for the next three years. The being that had entered into Jesus then went through the mystery of Golgotha. This is not the place or time to describe in detail the mystery of Golgotha, but spiritual science confirms from its point of view, from its fully scientific point of view, what the Gospels relate. Through what took place on Golgotha, this being, who could previously be found only in the spiritual heights, united with earthly humanity, and now lives since the time of Christ's passing through death on Golgotha in all human souls. It is the source of strength through which every soul can find its way into the spiritual world. The human race on earth has become transformed in soul through the mystery of Golgotha. The Christ came, as he himself said, in quotes, from above. But he has now moved into our human earthly world. Spiritual science is often reproached for saying that Jesus was not always the Christ, that Christ's life on earth began only when Jesus was 30 years old. Spiritual science is frequently confronted by shallow statements that stem from prejudice. Merely acknowledging certain facts instantly invites prejudice. And this holds true of almost everything said by our opponents regarding the position taken by spiritual science on Christianity. However, is it not correct to say that we only begin to remember around the age of three? And do people therefore conclude that what exists in us at a later time was not already present at an earlier time? When we speak of Christ's entering into Jesus at the baptism in the Jordan, Are we thereby denying that Christ was already connected to Jesus from birth on? We would not deny this any more than we would deny that the child has a soul before the soul becomes aware of itself during the third year of life. People need only understand correctly what spiritual science has to say, and they would no longer oppose it. Spiritual science also is reproached for making Christ into a cosmic being. In reality, anthroposophy only broadens our usual way of looking at things beyond the merely earthly physical concerns to the wide reaches of the universe so that our knowledge can embrace the universe spiritually just as Copernicus with his knowledge embraced the external world. The fact that spiritual science feels the need to incorporate into its knowledge that which is most holy to it simply is in keeping with a feeling that is religious and deeply scientific at the same time. Before Copernicus, people evaluated the movements of the cosmic bodies on the basis of what they saw. Since then, 
they have learned to evaluate these things independent of their sensory perception. Is spiritual science to be blamed for doing the same with respect to the spiritual concerns of humanity? Until recently people regarded Christianity and the life of Christ Jesus in a certain way, the only way possible for them. Spiritual science aims to widen this view to include cosmic spiritual wits. It augments what was previously known with what it it is able to say about Christ out of its research. It recognizes in Christ a being who is eternal, a being who entered once only into a human physical body, a being who is different from other human beings in that he does not go through repeated lives on earth. Christ has lived in a human body once only and is now united with all human souls. People who attack spiritual science from the viewpoint of Christianity commit a peculiar error. If one were to inquire of spiritual science whether it opposes what can be found in Christianity, then one would discover that it affirms everything Christianity stands for, but that it actually adds something to it. And if someone wants to ban what spiritual science has to add, then this does not mean that one is affirming Christianity, but rather that one is affirming a narrow view of it. In other words, it means that one would be acting just like those who spoke against Copernicus, Galileo, and Giordano Bruno in the way I described. It is easy to see the logical error at the root of this argument. And then there are people who come along and claim that we are Gnostics because we, quote, talk of a cosmic Christ living in the far reaches of the universe, close quote. This is an error in judgment comparable to the one we would make if we were to say, quote, I have just been given money by someone who owed me thirty kroner, but he gave me forty because he was lending me ten in addition, close quote, and would then insist that this person has not paid his debt because he returned forty kroner instead of thirty. This would be a foolish argument. If people come and reproach us for saying things about Christ in addition to what is usually said, then they do not realize the mistake they are making, for they are not speaking objectively, but rather out of strong emotions. People can, of course, debate whether or not the findings of spiritual science about Christianity mean anything to them. This all depends on what people think they need. One could, after all, also reject Copernicus, Galileo, or Giordano Bruno, but one cannot claim that spiritual science cares less about Christianity or that it is hostile to it. There is something else that still needs to be addressed when the relationship of spiritual science to Christianity is discussed. Humanity changes as individual human beings reincarnate and go from epoch to epoch. Our souls experienced life on earth in times when Christ had not yet joined with the earth, and they will go through further earthly lives in which Christ is united with the earth. From now on, Christ actually lives in human souls. And as our souls acquire ever greater depth, as they live through successive lives on earth, they become increasingly more independent and inwardly ever freer. This is why people continually need new tools for understanding ancient wisdom and why they must, out of this inner freedom, expand and enhance their understanding. Consequently, it must be said that it is precisely through spiritual science that Christianity can be recognized in such depth, truth, and significance that this science can be relied upon when it proclaims these ancient Christian truths in a new form. Although there will always be people who, preferring to cling to their prejudices, believe that spiritual science undermines Christianity, anyone familiar with modern culture will find that precisely those who can no longer be Christians in the traditional sense may be the ones who will be convinced again, through spiritual science, of the truth of Christianity. Therefore, spiritual science has the right to convey to every human soul what it has to say about Christianity, because the Christ of whom it speaks can be found by every human soul within itself. But spiritual science also has the right to say 
that it recognizes Christ as the being who, because of the reality of the mystery of Golgotha, has truly entered into human souls and into the earthly world. Faith has nothing to fear from knowledge. For the objects of faith, when raised to the level of the Spirit, need not be shunned by the light of knowledge. In this way, spiritual science will win those souls for Christianity, who can only be won by not speaking to them like a religious prophet, but rather by addressing them as an unassuming scientist who draws their attention to what can be found in the field of spiritual science and causes the strings in every human soul to resonate with it. Although it is true that anyone can become a researcher in the field of the spirit, and you can find the required ways and means described in the books mentioned earlier. It is also true that those who are not spiritual researchers can be permeated by the truth if they let it work upon them in an objective way. But if people do not do this, then they will not be able to free themselves from prejudices. All truths reside in the human soul. Not everyone is able to be a spiritual researcher, and see the truth of the spiritual for him or herself. But the more our thinking is already freed from the sensory realm, the more it can accompany the spiritual scientist as he draws attention to what he investigates along spiritual paths. He only wants to make people aware that there are truths that can spring to life in every soul, because they are already present in it. Before closing, I would like to point out how spiritual science stands within modern cultural life. Spiritual science is in full agreement with a natural scientific way of forming concepts and thoughts. It wants to place itself into today's culture in the same way as the church canon Copernicus and Galileo and Giordano Bruno place themselves into the culture of their times. Think, for example, of Giordano Bruno. What did he actually do? Prior to his stepping forward and speaking words of such significance for human evolution, people had looked up to the skies and had spoken of the starry spheres as they believed they perceived them. They spoke of the blue vault of the heavens as the boundary of the universe. Copernicus, Galileo, Giordano Bruno had the courage to break through sensory appearances and to establish a new way of thinking. What then was Giordano Bruno actually saying? as he stood before those listening. He said, quote, Look at the blue vault of the heavens. Look at the firmament. You yourselves have created it through the limitations of your knowledge. Your eyes see only as far as it. Your eyes create this boundary. Close quote. Giordano Bruno extended people's view beyond these limits. He believed that it ought to be possible to point out that everlasting starry worlds were embedded in the vastness of space. What is the task of the spiritual researcher? I will, in all modesty, try to express it in terms of recent spiritual developments. The spiritual researcher must point to a, in quotes, time firmament, to the boundaries of birth and death for human life. He must also state that the external viewpoint sees birth and death as a time firmament because of the limitations of human intellect and powers of perception. Like Giordano Bruno, the spiritual researcher must point out that this time firmament does not really exist, but that it is only an outcome of the limitations of human perception. And just as Giordano Bruno pointed out, had to point out, how beyond the non-existent limits of space there are infinite worlds embedded in its vast expanses. So must the spiritual scientist explain that behind the perceived boundaries of birth and death lies never-ending time, and that the eternal aspect of the human soul, the eternal core of the human being, as it passes from life to life, is embedded in it. Spiritual science is fully consistent with what occurred in regards to natural science. I would like to draw attention once again to the fact that spiritual science has no desire to found a religion, that it, however, gives rise to a more religious mood in the life of the soul, and that it leads us to the being 
at the religious center of life to the Christ. Accordingly, I would like to say once more that inasmuch as it does not want to found a religious community, spiritual science does engender a deepened religious awareness. Anyone fearing that spiritual science could destroy one's religious awareness resembles a person, if I may use this analogy, who might have confronted Columbus before he set sail for America and asked, quote, What is the point of discovering America? The sun rises so beautifully here in good old Europe. Can we at all be sure that the sun also rises in America, warming people and illuminating the earth? Close quote. Anyone familiar with the reality of physical existence on earth, however, would have known that the sun shines on all continents. And anyone fearing for our Christianity is like someone fearing the discovery of a new continent because, quote, the sun might not shine there, close quote. Anyone who truly bears the Christ Son in his or her soul knows that the Christ Son shines on every continent. And regardless of what may still be discovered, be it in realms of nature or in realms of spirit, the, quote, America of the Spirit, close quote, will never be discovered unless we turn with a sense of belonging and out of true religiosity toward the Christ Son as the center of earth existence. And unless that Christ Son shines, illumining, warming, and enkindling human souls. Only those whose religious feeling is weak would fear that it could die or waste away in the context of newly discovered conditions. Those, however, who are strong in a genuine feeling for the Christ will not be afraid of knowledge. They will not be afraid that knowledge might somehow undermine faith. Spiritual science exists on the basis of this trust, this conviction, and it is out of this confidence that it speaks to contemporary culture. It knows the true religious thinking and feeling cannot be endangered by research of any kind, but that only a weak religiosity has anything to fear. Spiritual science knows that we can trust our sense for truth, and as a result of shattering events in his soul life, and what he factually went through, the spiritual researcher knows what lives in the depths of the human soul. Through his investigations he has developed confidence in the human soul because he understands that it has a most intimate relationship to the truth. As a result he believes, however much the signs of the times may oppose it, in the ultimate success of spiritual science. And he counts on the love of truth and the genuine religiosity in the soul life of human beings to bring about this victory. The end of Lecture 10, that is the end of this book, Christ and the Human Soul, Collected Works, Volume 155 by Rudolf Steiner, translated by Agnes Schneeberg de Stur.